The Center for Constitutional Rights, birthed 52 years ago during the civil rights movements, stands with social justice movements and communities under threat, fusing litigation, advocacy, and narrative shifting to dismantle systems of oppression regardless of the risk. While our foundation is built on partnerships, the key phrase in our new mission statement is that we stand with social justice movements. We are their partners, and together, by fighting and building power, we center their struggles for liberation, transform systems, policies, and public narratives. In a minute, you'll hear from three key movement partners and leaders in the social justice space who I'm sure will have a lively discussion on intersectionality in our movements, why cross-movement collaboration is essential. But before that, I would like to introduce Bahar Azmi, our legal director at the Center for Constitutional Rights, who will provide some highlights of our work from 2018. Good evening, everyone. As Chandra mentioned, I am the legal director of CCR, the Center for Constitutional Rights, which gives me the enormous privilege of working with an incredible, range of fierce and dedicated and radical uh, lawyers and advocates in our organization on virtually every case and project that we undertake. As Chandra said, it's just sort of a, a, an amazing year, as we've had in many years before, and we are continuing to center our work um, in a radical way by taking on, at the root, systems of oppression, whether they uh, the, systems that come from the wielding of state power, uh, uh, structural racism, structural gender oppression, and economic oppression. And as Chandra said, we do that in a, in, a, in a way we take on that power by centering those most impacted by those uh, forms of abuse. Um, and so uh, here are just some kind of representative samples of, the, of our accomplishments in this past year. And I'll, I'll start with um, what I think is the best caption case uh, uh, since Loving versus Virginia called Black Love Resists in the Rust versus City of Buffalo. Yes. Um, on behalf of a really terrific grassroots police accountability organization there and some individuals who fi finally had enough and sued the Buffalo Police Department because they, the, the Buffalo Police Department and their so-called strike force had deployed traffic check vehicle checkpoints on the pretext of trying to, to stop crime. And guess where those vehicle checkpoints were located? 91% uh, of them were located in black, black and brown communities, sort of almost literally fencing people in um, on a regular basis and preventing them from accessing jobs, uh, schools, uh, and, and their lives. Um, and if that weren't bad enough, it's sort of very uh, uh, reminiscent of the uh, NYPD Stop and Frisk program. This turned out to be an enormously profitable mechanism for the city of Buffalo uh, because they were using these traffic vehicle checkpoints to charge people with traffic violations. Uh, and when the city got to take that revenue from the state, they started using the, 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 the checkpoints more aggressively, making millions and millions of, of, of dollars. Because they're not, in order to advance their sort of regenerative, the new Buffalo goal, they're not imposing property taxes on uh, white properties in the east side of Buffalo. Um, they're doing a de facto tax of uh, black and brown folks. And, and literally uh, raising money off the, the, the backs of those communities. Also, along with Color of Change, an organization you know, we filed the uh, Freedom of Information Act to get at this sort of uh, strange obsession by the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security with what they call black identity extremists. Just like uh, his predecessor, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions, seem to think that anyone who's a black activist is a black extremist. And it's the, the FOIA revealed and the related advocacy engaging in regular surveillance, monitoring, and attempted infiltration, as law enforcement always does with demands for social justice from um, black and brown communities. Um, we also uncovered um, a document titled, ominously, a race paper, and we should always get a little bit startled when a government document has a race paper at the top, particularly from this government. Um, so we sued uh, to get that, the, the all black set of redactions under the title disclosed. 
the government wouldn't give it to us because they said, unfortunately, the court agreed. That's not actually finalized yet, and so we couldn't get it, but I think it exposed and put a lot of pressure on the government for uh, what we all suspected we were doing, but it's now more in the open. Continuing on the sort of racial injustice framework, some of you may know that we reached an incredible landmark settlement with the state of California and with one then Attorney General Kamala Harris, um, ending <laughs> indefinite solitary confinement in California, which resulted in the release of over a thousand men from solitary confinement. Hundreds. Uh, hundreds of whom had been in solitary 23 hours a day in five by eight cages without human contact for 10 years, 20 years, and even 30 years. Um, but as we know from our work monitoring the stop and frisk victory um, against the NYPD, institutions always backslide. So we've been monitoring carefully what the, the California prison system has been doing, and they have in fact been backsliding and punishing individuals in the, uh, who were formerly uh, in solitary confinement with sort of overbroad, made up charges of gang allegations. And only last Friday, we got a decision from the, the court saying that the state had engaged in systematic due process violations in ordering the state to submit to another year of court monitoring, which we will do. Uh, there's sometimes some sort of ungrammatic parts of the work, but uh, being careful and obsessive and holding uh, the, the governments accountable to their obligations is obviously a really important part of long-term social justice lawyering. Um, so turning to the border, where we've been very active, our lawyers and advocates have been to uh, Tijuana, um, Laredo, Juarez, uh, working with a number of activists and organizers there uh, supporting migrants trying to cross the U.S. border and seek asylum. Uh, we joined with the ACLU and Southern Poverty Law Center to get an injunction ruling that the Trump administration's uh, attempted ban on asylum for individuals who cross outside of ports of entry. Um, and we were successful in getting that uh, ruled illegal by a district judge and the, the Department of Justice raced to the Court of Appeals to say, uh, you have to reverse this decision, people are going to die. Uh, if people do what they've always been doing, which is you know, cross the border. And then when they lost, they raced to the Supreme Court, screaming, if you don't reverse this decision, people are going to die. You, um, hurry, hurry, reverse the decision. And when the Supreme Court uh, disagreed with them, scarily enough, only five to four, given the, the obvious illegality of this practice, they promptly put their pencils down and said, well, we can't actually appeal this because the government shut down and we have no money. So apparently it wasn't that much of an emergency. We've also worked to challenge the practice of turning people away. So the, the Trump administration was trying to bar people from entering outside of ports of entry, so-called unlawfully, uh, in an effort to, quote, channel individuals into lawful asylum applications at ports of entry. But what we knew from two years earlier from the lawsuit we filed is that even at ports of entry, the Trump administration was turning people away denying them access to asylum by lying about the unavailability of asylum, coercing them to withdraw their asylum applications, and the most recent manifestation, putting people on enormous waiting lists, keeping them on the other side of the Mexican border for up to six weeks before they can apply, claiming they have no capacity. Lying about them. They have no capacity. So Trump is right that there is a humanitarian crisis at the border, but it's caused by the Trump administration, mm. because people are uh, being for incredibly vulnerable populations, children, LGBT folks, Q folks, women, uh, individuals subject to uh, cartel and gang violence are languishing on the Mexican side of the border uh, in incredibly dangerous conditions. We don't usually take family, uh, take individual cases, but uh, we uh, felt compelled to represent two sets of families who were separated. One, I'll tell you about Mr. C, uh, crossed uh, the border uh, into Texas um, with his then 19-month-old son after two days in the notorious ice box, had a son forcibly taken from him at 19 months, and they spent five months detained separately in New York. And along with a law firm, we filed a habeas corpus petition, um, arguing among other things that the separation of a child from his or her parent in this sustained way for the purposes, the cruel purpose of deterrence, uh, meets the literal definition of torture.
And in court, there's a way in which the federal judge agreed because when he ordered the government to immediately reunify this man with his son, having been separated for a quarter of the son's life, he called this the most cruel of all the cruelties. And I have, from a former life, we're going to talk about a number of German friends, and when they were, a couple of them were visiting here, I mentioned this practice of ripping a child from the, the family at the, at the border. And one seemed confused, even though as, as much as he knew about the malice of the, the Trump administration, he said, I, but I don't understand, this is Gestapo. And it is. So we worked to, to remind people that this is horrific, but that also this comes in a context where parents are being separated from families, maybe in a less dramatic way, but all the time, in, in light of our system of mass incarceration. The family separation policy is not just a product of the sort of white supremacist agenda of the Trump administration to exclude Latinos from the United States. It's also part of their effort to exclude Muslims, but not from the southern border, but at airports and consulates. So after the Muslim ban, we were among a <laughs> number of organizations trying to uh, respond. And one, one thing we did in particular, given our connections to the Yemeni community in New York City, um, is to notice that the Yemeni community was particularly hard hit. Um, and before the Supreme Court decided the Muslim ban case, our team traveled to Djibouti, where to interview hundreds of stranded Yemenis. They were stranded there because they couldn't apply for visas in Yemen, given that it was war-torn and one of the most uh, serious humanitarian um, uh, disasters in, in the world right now. So they traveled to Djibouti to try and apply um, and were systematically denied. So we wrote a report documenting the human impact of individuals stranded there and what it's like to be away from your family in the United States trying to come here. Uh, so the Muslim ban is also a family separation policy. Um, and we wrote a report which was cited by Justice Breyer, unfortunately in dissent. Um, but thereafter we filed a, um, a case on behalf of three um, U.S. citizens seeking to bring their families here who had been not denied under the Muslim ban. And when we filed the case in the middle of December, um, and after filing, and after their really impressive appearance on Democracy Now!, including um, the appearance of little Arouge, who was four years old and talked about um, not having seen her mother for two years and never having met her babysitter stuck in Djibouti. Um, Happily, just two weeks ago, the U.S. government apparently caved and granted them all visas, and they've been reunited in the United States. <laughs> One major thing we expect to happen in 2019, after over 11 years of incredibly hard-fought litigation, we finally hope to take to trial a private military contractor responsible for the torture and abuse of Iraqi citizens in Abu Ghraib. <laughs> One of the things that we're going to do now is we're going to start transitioning into uh, a discussion, um, not just about some of the themes that uh, Bahar has talked about and what we'll hear about a little bit more in some clips, but we're also going to talk uh, with some of our really fabulous guests about not just what we need to fight, but also what we need to build and how we build. So let me just take this moment to introduce and bring up to the stage uh, Ju Hyun Kang, the Executive Director of the CPR, CPR Action Fund, and for anybody that knows anything about the Floyd litigation and the, uh, the work around Stop and Frisk knows that Ju Hyun is right there in the middle of it, an extraordinary organizer. I also want to bring to the stage Kei Han Irani. <laughs> Kei Han is an Emmy Award winning writer, performer, and theater of the oppressed trainer. One of the things that Kei Han does in her work is that she thinks about art not just as a static uh, thing to be observed, but as a conversation, and particularly conversations around communities and people that are embroiled in making the change that they want to see for themselves. And then finally, last but not least, uh, Carl Williams, a distinguished practitioner and resident at Cornell University. He's a research associate fellow, uh, research fellow and former staff attorney at the ACLU, of Massachusetts. Carl was also on the steering committee of Law for Black Lives in 2015, for y'all that remember that. 
um, and he is doing some amazing work, and really one of the movement lawyers um, that I, I admire and look forward to working with. We're going to be showing a series of very short clips from a forthcoming uh, film about all of the work that we did this year, and this is going to be the opening clip. Our approach is what we like to call movement lawyering, which is frequently to, to partner with those communities who are most impacted by injustice and use law not as an end in itself, but as a tool to advance their particular uh, interests and to help them be, to organize, mobilize, clear legal obstacles in, in that block their capacity to organize and build and advance their narratives and their storytelling through media, advocacy, and public education. I want to ask Carl, um, you are a movement lawyer, and we know that movement lawyering and alliance building across fields are really important aspects of social movement dynamics, and they can contribute energy and approach and capacity to win. Two questions. Do you have any examples of to share of when you or your organization built such an alliance based on movement lawyering? And what outcomes were you able to achieve through that methodology um, that you wouldn't be able to achieve either as what we call a straight lawyer or by yourself? Um, I don't like this question. No. <laughs> I, I, really, I appreciate this question and I was thinking about it. There's an example, but I need to compress it because there are so many pieces to it. Um, some of us in Massachusetts received a call from some, some folks that we didn't know too well in, um, in Portland, Maine. And uh, some Black Lives Matter folks there, this is about two and a half years ago, Black Lives Matter folks there um, had gotten arrested in a demonstration. And if people know Portland, Maine, the black community, there, it, a lot of the New York community is, is Somali, is Somali American or, or for, um, Somali immigrants, um, and also Muslim. Um, so they were feeling a lot of pressure because they were arrested, they were criminally charged, and they were worried about that. They had some lawyers there who volunteered. So not, I'll say not movement lawyers, but volunteer lawyers. And the volunteer lawyer said, well, we can get you this plea, and they're going to drop the charges to a, a civil infraction, and you can pay a fine, and then you have to go to this meeting, uh, a restorative, a thing they were going to call a restorative justice meeting. And they didn't like this idea. They weren't very pleased about that at all. And it wasn't a political, the lawyers who were, who were representing them didn't have a political attitude toward this. Um, and the, the defendants, these, these activists, these organizers, were pissed. So uh, me and some of my colleagues got a call, and, and they wanted us to go up there and fix it. They wanted us to convince these, uh, these demonstrators to say, it's a good deal, you should take it. So, so I was asked to go up. I said, can, can I just say what I want to say when I go up, or do you want me to sell, say the thing that you want me to say? And they said, no, 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 you can, you can just say whatever you want. And I went up and I told them, I said, well, you should do this. I go, you should, this is not, you, you're the client, you're the movement, you're the ones who should be understanding. I mean, who, who better? But, you know, Somali immigrant Muslim women who are standing up for justice and who got arrested for that stand, taking a stand in, you know, one, one of the whitest cities in the United States, right? And coldest. Um, standing up for justice. So we went up and we said, you know, power to you guys. You do what you want. And then they were just on, just us, you know, going up there and talking to them very briefly, it gave them the agency to do what they wanted to do in the beginning. So they went into this restorative justice circle that really wasn't, it really wasn't that at all. It was really them going to be shamed. And they said, we're not going to do it this way. We don't want that prosecutor in the room. And we're not going to talk to those people. Let's go. Right? And they raised hell. And everybody got mad at them. <laughs> and then actually their case got put back on the list. They were going to be re-prosecuted. Um, and then we went up, we brought a whole crew of people, activists, organizers um, from Boston, um, people from the Muslim community in Boston, um, uh, movement lawyers from Boston and had a big circle um, and talked to the, the lawyers there about movement lawyering, um, about actually just the criminal defense. One of the, the fascinating bits is uh, one, of, one of the lawyers from Boston said, how is any police officer going to identify any of these black Muslim women who are all wearing black hijabs and are about you know, the same beautiful coffee color? Like, how, how are they going to do that? I said, oh, there's an amazing way we can defend this case. So they went, they fought like hell, all the cases got dismissed, the prosecutors were furious and had a, a press conference that nobody came to, and all the activists and organizers had a giant press conference that everybody came to. And now, they, right after that, tragically, um, a, a, a black person was murdered by the Portland police, who was what they were talking about all the time. But they were free to fight like hell about that, because they weren't on probation, they didn't have an open case, 
and they're still fighting like hell um, for the liberation of black folks, of queer folks, of women, of Muslims, of immigrants um, in New England. And I, I just feel like, you know, that wasn't our work, it was just us standing behind people saying, you know, go do what you do. And, and that's like the, the work that I'm most proud of. And it's the work that CSNAP does. This, this is great, let's continue with this. I wanted to throw this out to, to Kehan and Juhan. Ju um, power centering um, po politics. How important is it in the work that we do together and the work that you do? Uh, when, you, when are you out front and when are you supporting and behind it? What does that look like? In your world? Um, for, for me, it's really, I. I view art making or art processes as um, both product and process. And so part of my work is to create art story for other people to engage with and consume. But more, for me, more importantly, is bringing people into a process of their own art making and their own creative exploration, which for me is politically motivated or, or part of a, a political analysis because I believe that creativity and art making is part of our human birthright and um, systematically certain people have been told that they are not creative and they are not thinkers and they are not able to um, create visions for the future for everyone to get behind. So it's, for me, part of movement building is bringing people into collective action um, through a process of collective understanding where they are taking the tools of what they see, how they feel, um, using their bodies to create images to, um, and innovating from the margins. And so it's not about how do we create a story that resonates with this person's campaign because we want to get more media attention. It really is about how do we um, uh, lift up and cultivate a vision from uh, the people who are, are dealing with whatever they're dealing with. Um, so it's, it's about you know, the artistic means of production and uh, claiming those as part of visioning for political action, collective action, collective understanding. Um, I really love what you just said in terms of that. Uh, and I think that what I would add to it is that a lot of times what we really try to think about, at least the Community Center for Police Reform, is for the staff that we're not actually the center of this, um, that it's got to be uh, our member organizations that are grassroots member organizations um, and their members. And so our role is to really facilitate um, spaces where people can make democratic decisions with full knowledge and full information. Because for us, it's really about modeling what governance looks like in general. Um, so all of our decisions actually go through a significant process, uh, but people have gotten really fast at it. And so when we get to the question of power, I feel like our goal, though, is not just the process. The goal is to build power for uh, communities that are most oppressed in this country. And so it's all the communities that the community, uh, that, uh, Center for Constitutional Rights really fights on behalf of, and that Bahar talked about um, working on cases for in 2018. But it's really also about thinking about how do we create power for communities in a way that is political, that takes um, a long view of what liberation is going to be, but not so long that we think we will never, ever achieve it. So that we're really trying to build a process of liberation through our work and trying to every day, even though we fail oftentimes, build a way of being that is going to liberate all of us. Let me ask you about that because we were at a point when we were looking forward. Uh, there are a lot of people that are very activated about this particular moment in history with this particular administration. Um, there are a lot of people that are putting this particular moment in the context of many historical moments. Um, but what's your response to the folks that uh, will say, look, we actually need a focused strategy. We need to make the wins in the electoral system. Uh, we need to get somebody on the Supreme Court. We need to file really targeted cases. We need to only come up with things that are going to win. Is that the same thing that you're talking about? Or is it different? And what's your response to that? Anybody? Anybody at all? I, I think it's, it's a level, right? So, so a lot of people are sort of, I don't really want to say waking up, but a lot of people are excited about the idea that there are problems happening in the country right now, right? So one very positive thing about that is, you know, the Women's March, the first Women's March was the largest, I think it's the largest thing that human beings collectively have ever done, except for watch something. In this country, so. No, 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 but in the, in the, oh, the world, the world, world, yeah. I mean, because it was multi-millions of people, you know, people in Rome that were concerned, there were people in, in you know, in, in Tokyo that were concerned. There were people all across. There was a boat in Antarctica. There were seven people on it. There was a picture. Um, um, for real. And um, that is a good thing, 
right? That, that people who might not have a sort of full political view of, you know, what, what um, the, the, the oppressions that people um, have been under in this country and around the world um, from the powers that be are a little bit open to that. I mean, they, a lot of people, I think, think you know, Molly was going to save us all. Um, but um, uh, I, I think now is a moment that more people can be convinced. We're certainly not going to convince all of those people, but now is a great moment um, to try to convince those people to say, like, you know, look at, you know, what our federal court system looks like. Look at how, you know, these people are going to be appointed and that you know, Trump is going to appoint whatever it is, 158, you know, federal court judges, not just on the Supreme Court. You know, so you can just go into a, a federal district court. You're going to face, you know, a mini Jeff Sessions, or well, you can't be a mini Jeff Sessions because he's a little man. Um, but, but you're facing someone who is, you know, essentially like a political clone of Jeff Sessions. And that's going to be horrifying. I mean, you know, for, for the folks who litigate, you know, if you have someone who's, you know, beat up by the police and you walk in and it's one of these Trump appointees, that's going to be a horrifying thing. There's not a lot right now that we can do about that, but we can, we need to fight for the very, very long haul. Um, and I think now is the moment that people are starting to realize all of these the pieces of this, right? Yeah, I think what I would add is that um, the past few years, I feel like it's been this huge project of political education in this country, um, where uh, folks who might not be involved in politics are really actually learning more about what happens in other communities that they might not be part of. They're also really uh, learning more and more about how injustice is embedded in the history and fabric of this country. And so I feel like the lesson that we hope to learn out of this is that this isn't only about Trump or 45 or the orange man, whatever you want to call him. It's really about an entire history that enabled somebody like Trump to be elected president. And that in this period, there's this huge acceleration of a right-wing agenda, right? Not one week has gone by since the election where some massive dismantling of federal protections hasn't happened. And so it's going to take us decades to undo that, but I think back to... Vince, I feel like your question is really like, what about the what about the folks who are basically centrist forces who are saying, let's just take back certain parts of government to democratic liberal hands, um, versus other folks who might want something that's much more transformational. And I think part of the challenge right now is that we're playing defense and offense, mm -hmm. and a lot of times we don't really um, on the left uh, have not had a, a lot of history in being able to play defense and offense at the same time with multi tier strategy. And that's actually the challenge we have right now. And the beauty is that so many organizers and activists and people who've been activated in the past few years have a dream and a different um, vision for what the future could be that is much more expansive than what the democratic establishment has told us is possible. And so if we can actually even move towards that dream, it changes uh, the conditions under which politics is played. Thank you. Give it up. Yes. Well, give it up. <laughs> I'm going to come to you after um, this next clip that we're going to show. So Black Blood Resisting Arrest versus the City of Buffalo is a constitutional challenge to the Buffalo, New York Police Department's vehicle checkpoint and traffic ticketing practices. We are alleging and we will prove that those practices constitute illegal searches and seizures, um, that they are racially discriminatory, and that they introduce a profit motive into the justice system that violates due process of law. Well, I think there's a tremendous psychological trauma that this is causing to communities of color, creating a sense of fear so that people really are literally afraid to leave their homes, to get in their cars, to try to drive to work and school because they're afraid they could be stopped, ticketed, and even arrested at any time. And it has a tremendously uh, severe financial impact as well because you're talking about thousands of dollars in fines, license suspensions, towing fees that are being imposed on working class and low income folks in Buffalo. And even though tickets might seem like a minor inconvenience, the way that this policy is designed is that it's really designed to have collateral consequences on black communities in Buffalo. So we have the really great fortune to be working with a tremendous grassroots organization called Black Love Resistant Arrest, which has been doing racial justice and anti-police brutality work in Buffalo for many years. They um, are very committed to this case. They're committed to raising awareness in communities of color throughout the city about both these practices as well as other abusive practices in the Buffalo Police Department. One outcome that we obviously want is to end these practices, but I think beyond that, and maybe even more importantly, we feel that this case can be a really great way to empower communities around issues of police misconduct and police reform and to 
give those folks who have historically borne the brunt of these practices a real meaningful say into how to change policing in Buffalo going forward. Kids don't so black love like resistance. <laughs> there There's a good reason why my kids don't give me the clicker, and that's one of them. I, I actually queued up the wrong clip. Um, it's, it's a nice looking clip. But let's, let's just make that transition since we're the first time. Improvisation is my middle name. Um, I'm going to start with, with Jukon, and then I, you know, I'll invite you, Kayon, to, to jump in on this. Um, but switching this up a little bit, we were just talking about um, a new relationship uh, that we've been able to build with um, some of the organizers of Buffalo and building on our work that we've done together um, here in New York with respect to Stop and Frisk, um, a couple of things. One is that we feel that we actually have a good sense as lawyers as what the balance is between um, the lawyering and the movement and the organizing. But talk to us a little bit, are there such things as the wrong types of lawyers for organizing space? <laughs> organizing spaces. And um, if you were if you were going to talk to um, you know new lawyers that are thinking about this work, what do they need to know about organizing in communities, and what would be some of the things that you would tell them? Um, so you know, of course, that's not your first question. Are there such things as uh, wrong lawyers for organizing spaces? Sure, um, but I think really the, the answer I have is that I don't know about wrong lawyers, but there is. Uh, there are ways where uh, individual lawyers can be very harmful to organizing and movement spaces if they're not conscious of their own power dynamics and also if they're uh, not, if, you know, if they take up too much space. And so I feel like for new lawyers, part of what we would say, um, there's a few things that we do with lawyers that we work with who are part of the United Police Reform or who we partner with. One is that we tell them when they are in our spaces uh, and they're explaining the law, their opinion is their opinion. Sometimes just the mere presence of someone who is a lawyer um, carries an authority as fact when sometimes it's an interpretation of the law that they're giving or an opinion about whether or not somebody should take a bad plea deal. And that that's actually just completely unfair to folks who are trying to understand what their options are. So for one thing is opinion is opinion. The second thing I feel like we really try to emphasize is that it's really important to understand what the power dynamic is. And so one question we ask our folks to think about, not just attorneys, but all of us, is whose power are we trying to build? Um, it's not our individual power, is what we would say. That we're trying to build the power of broad communities. And in order to do that, that means putting, like checking aside ego, but it also really means being able to be very precise. If uh, an attorney is in the room for a legislative meeting, for example, where we're trying to decide how to do a bill, around something that's been identified as a need and a solution, we really try to break it down into what's the policy objective we're really trying to achieve, what does the law currently say, and what are the politics in that situation. And just because someone's a lawyer, it doesn't mean that they know those three things. Everybody in the room can have an opinion about all those three things. And so we really, I think part of what's so important is to really demystify um, what the role of a lawyer is and what the law is so that uh, folks who are clients or folks who are partners can really be able to engage in an honest and authentic way. Uh, we know that targeted policing uh, requires intersectionality, but when we think about the, the dominant statistics that we hear about policing and police enforcement, it tends to center around black men, uh, people who are black or of African descent, people who identify as male and poor folks. But left out of that equation, out of that dominant statistic that drives a lot of the passion around this is that we're not talking about um, how uh, the police treat female-identified people. We're not talking about LGBTQI communities. We're not talking about Muslims. We're not talking about immigrants. Um, how do, in your, in your work and your thinking, how do you center communities so that people don't, get, don't fall so in love with a dominant narrative that is essentially exclusionary and can sort of reconfigure their, their conception of justice and their politics um, to understand how it actually impacts broad ranges of people on I think it's just um, what you said is very key the, when we're looking at this idea of the dominant narrative. And it touches back to even your previous question about people's hope in the bureaucrats and the technocrats to solve problems. And uh, that kind of feeds back into a dominant narrative that professional people and people who have certain titles and have certain roles are the ones who are capable and able uh, to do big things or to do important things. And everyone else needs to just 
get in line and support the people who know or the people who are already in power. And that goes back even further, you know, to this binary thinking, this binary language that we use of good and bad and, you know, civilized and uncivilized and the ways in which we structured our society to have these value judgments and um, institutions built around proliferating these value judgments and these narratives around who's worthy, who's unworthy. Um, so much so that, of course, uh, those who are being oppressed and internalize the oppression and replay those narratives and say, well, there must be some reason why I'm uh, in jail or there must be some reason why I'm poor or I must, uh, in order to make change, I must support, um, you know, a, a centrist, uh, well-known technocratic person rather than uh, how, do we, how do we uncover and how do we reveal all the concealed stories uh, that exist under the dominant narrative that um, pretty much um, betray the lie of the narrative. Um, looking at, you know, these are all legacies of, you know, entitled um, enlightenment thinking, in fact, you know, whereas you have these binaries created of, uh, again, civilized and uncivilized man and uh, beast that then become part of the thinking and the narrative around the colonial and empire building project that then become uh, uh, um, the narratives of the institutions of education and arts and culture that we then breathe and eat and sleep with and inhale all day long. Um, so, <laughs> the, the, one of the main things that I look at is, is from the perspective of the oppressed, how do we undo the internalized oppression? And so part of intersectionality is not just me seeing what's the, what's the, um, what's the condition of the other. Um, I have to see what's, what's my condition, but also where have I acted on behalf of the oppressor? Where have I played out the narrative of the oppressor in my life and in the way I move and think about the world? So much so that the, the other is hidden from me. So, though, so much so that I accept an other in my life, except an other in the world who must be treated harshly or who must be um, uh, hidden from view or uh, something like that. So that's the very circular way of <laughs> how I look at culture and art um, to kind of bring intersectionality in on a very uh, small cellular level, but again, to then mobilize people's ability to see beyond the veil and to say, oh yes, we must include, we must um, build bridges. Just one piece of, in, after listening to all that, I, I, I think there's, it just made me think of, um, one of the, I think one of the most valuable things I learned when I was in, back when I was in law school was um, in a hall somewhere that someone mentioned to me. And I think it's, if you can, if we define the question, we, we sort of win the debate, right? And when we're trying to say, how, do, how can we be intersectional about this? How can we include, you know, you know uh, uh, the different um, groups that are, that are feeling these oppressions? But when we talk about, if we say, how do we include those in you know, a question of uh, police brutality or you know, deportation, what we're talking about is state violence. That tree has a lot of roots and it has a lot of leaves. One of them is police brutality. One of them is, I don't know what you call it, FBI, federal police brutality. Um, one of them is you know, border agent and Customs and Border Patrol you know, ripping families apart and federal decisions and court decisions. If you say, if we start talking about it as state violence, um, that is something that, that is an umbrella that covers, that covers a lot of people, right? And for people who are not directly affected by that, they, they have some buy-in, they're like, oh, well, I'm concerned about that group. And then you start to say, well, well, why aren't I concerned about that group? And this is what we should, you know, people of good faith, people who have, you know, the politics should be saying to people. It's like, you really concerned about immigrants right now, right? How is that different than, uh, than uh, Native people, you know, being, uh, beaten and attacked and having uh, um, resources taken away from them. How is that different from trans folks, you know, being harassed and arrested and beaten by, by police in our communities? Why is that, is that state violence any different than this, this other emanation of the same exact state violence? And I think that is a really useful way to, um, maybe to, to make the intersectionality seem a lot less intersectional. It's, it's really one struggle, right? Because the, the, any one piece of that is not going to end entirely until the other piece is end. Absolutely, yeah, and I, I totally agree. Um, I also wanted just to add just a couple of things to this, which was in the list of uh, examples, um, I'd written down um, 
Native folks and folks with disabilities in the group that groups that do not get centered around the, uh, the policing and law enforcement narratives. I just wanted to add that. And that you kind of just not necessarily responding to that, but your thoughts on the question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's three things I want to say. One is um, just to, like, my, I was raised in a lot of ways, I, can't, I got politicized really in part um, through racial justice work, but also out of the queer movement. And uh, I was lucky enough to do that mostly in a space with uh, mostly queer and trans folks of color. And that, I feel like for me, was pivotal because the roots of the kind of queer liberation movement in this country, a lot of people trace to Stonewall, which was really um, a rebellion against police oppression. Uh, and one of the things that I learned when um, uh, Silvia Rivera, who was one of the folks who um, was at Stonewall, she was a trans Puerto Rican woman, uh, passed a number of years ago, but one of the things that I feel like she talked about um, before passing was how the folks who were getting really screwed up by the cops were not just black and trans, uh, black and Puerto Rican trans women, but also white homeless youth. Um, and for the people who really fought back against the cops, at least from her perspective and perspective of some other folks at that time, were predominantly homeless folk um, and uh, trans folk and low-income people. It wasn't the broad uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community. And so I feel like that's always been an important story for me to kind of carry because it really shows that what history doesn't really tell us is who ends up being in the front lines of something like a fight against state violence. The second thing I want to say, which may not be that popular, is I don't love the word intersectionality. Um, that doesn't mean I don't love the concept of liberation for all people. But I do think sometimes uh, when we just talk about intersectionality, um, the way it gets talked about these days is let's just make sure we include a lot of different examples, which is really not the root of the issue. And for me, intersectionality really goes back to, um, uh, even before this, but one example would be the Kambahi River Collective, um, where uh, a number of black women, particularly black lesbians, wrote a statement talking about, you know, if we're gonna actually think about freedom, if we center black lesbians and black women in that, that really actually opens the doors to what liberation would look like. So for me, I feel like that's one way I would enter it. And when we talk about Native folk and people um, uh, with disabilities, I feel like in policing, that's what's invisibilized. But indigenous people are amongst the highest number, percentage of people who get killed by cops. And we have an ongoing epidemic where, depending on whose stats you believe, it's between 25 to 50% of people who are killed by police around the country are people who were in emotional distress or crisis at the time. Um, so if we don't actually understand that, we can't actually move on these issues, but I do get really worried sometimes about this, um, the way we use phrasing to not get into the, the root of uh, what organizing looks like. Awesome. Um, thank you for that. We're going to try to move to a different clip. We had their artwork uh, displayed at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. The exhibit was called Ode to the Sea, and it included a number of current and former detainees. Gala and Janelle are both out. They're free men now, uh, but they created a lot of really amazing artwork when they were at Guantanamo, uh, most of which we have in our offices. And the exhibit generated incredible media attention in a way that a lot of um, our other work, our litigation, our advocacy work just wasn't. And it's because the fact that art was a medium um, to talk about the, the men at Guantanamo, um, people found that really curious. And the success of the exhibit was that people came in to look at the art, but they left asking about the artists. What did you see here in, um, in, the, in the way that we've been thinking about um, the, the art of our clients, the men in Guantanamo? How does that connect to what you do? Where do you think we should be going in terms of working with artists as collaborators, as thought partners, as people that see things and feel things that we don't always do? That's a, that's a big question. Um, but one thing I just want to point out is that how she spoke about people being drawn to this art exhibit because they thought it was curious that prisoners at Guantanamo would, would make art. And so again, it's that, that binary language that if you're a prisoner, you're not an artist, you don't have a creative um, spirit, you, you're not able to, you know, why would you express yourself, or why would that be something, but, so it's fine that people came, and that's great. <laughs> um, I know that um, through that exhibit, I also, for me, what was important to learn about was to learn about the conditions in which they were kept in through what art they could make and what art they couldn't make, and what representations they could put on paper, so if you... Uh, learn more about the exhibit, you'll learn that they're certain they can't represent human figures um, because they were afraid that that would reveal 
um, something about who's on the inside and the guards and all that sort of thing. So it's very interesting to what art can reveal, the layers of what art can reveal that, you know, again, a policy brief or a, a lecture can't, um, and how it can um, um, spark something in, in each person that's different. You know, that's what I, that's what sparked for me. That, oh, what they were allowed to draw um, helps you understand what are the conditions that they're kept in and um, how, how the state sees them. And, um, and so, and so that's the possibility of using art both as a means of communication, but again, as a process um, of someone building their own understanding and building their own analysis of how they see their own liberation. Um, and so I think it's really powerful that, again, men who have next to nothing and who are um, super invisibilized then get the, the tools of production to say, here's what's in my heart and here's what's in my soul, and I have a soul and I have a heart. Um, and so the engagement of art, you know, is just, it's so deep and profound on so many levels. Um, and I do hope that more people use it, again, as a process, as a way of weaving and building um, the possibility of collective action, collective understanding, rather than just simply a messaging platform. Um, you know, similarly to like your annoyance a little with the way intersectionality gets used, my annoyance a little bit with the way arts and culture workers get used as a, it's a transaction for social justice work. Like, you, you do this for us and make us look interesting and people will be interested in us. It's, and it's not a transactional um, process, it's not a transactional relationship. The relationship has to be much deeper if you want to create portals into your movement through the art. If you just want to have a flat representation of your message, that's one thing. But if you really want to create a doorway for people to enter and join a movement, the art has to be much different. I was looking at a quote from Audre Lorde, and I wanted to ask you all to, to <laughs> comment on, on it. Uh, Audre Lorde once wrote, black and third world people are expected to educate white people as to our humanity. Women are expected to educate men. Lesbian and gay men are expected to educate the heterosexual world. The oppressors maintain their position and evade their responsibilities for their own actions. There is a constant drain of energy which might be better used in redefining ourselves and devising realistic scenarios for altering the present and constructing the future. And it seems to me that there are three central mandates that Audre Lorde um, asks us or commands us uh, to move forward on as we think about this next year, and I think the world that we want to build. One is how do we center the positioning of that oppression that faces our community? Two, how do we hold them accountable for their actions? And three, how are we def redefining ourselves and constructing the future? What do you all think about that? <laughs> um, so, um, I, well, that's a lot. Um, I think and one the of the lightning round in five minutes. Hmm? And the lightning round in five minutes. Someone had a science in five minutes. Y'all can't see that. Um, now it's two. Um, I, I think one thing is we have to be incredibly visionary. We have to look at society and say, what would it look like if people were entirely free, right? In this world, in this country, um, um, in New York, for all that, um, and and do things and try to to extend um, our work to that place. Um, I think all too often when we're in that daily grind in our organizations, in our work, um, it, um, uh, 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 doing our things, we have a tendency to just look forward to the, the very next short thing. And I think events like this, um, it's great that CCR and, and, and Vince uh, and all the rest of the folks brought brokers together to talk about these things, but being um, trying to be as visionary as possible and looking, you know, a hundred years down the road instead of, you know, my next five meetings. I, mean, I would just say, uh, speaking to what Audre Lorde is, is also asking of us, again, she's asking us to, to look at and confront the cop in our own head. Yeah. And um, so rather than, again, building it to this binary me and you are different or separate, again, where, what are we looking at in terms of power? You know, it's not about an, an individual or a race, it's about power. Where are the power dynamics that I need to break free from in order to create the biggest vision of humanity possible and it starts with removing that little cop from your head and looking at it, looking at that um, little voice that's been running you like a puppet um, and, and continually snipping the cords that try to reattach to your arms and legs. Um, 
and, and being in a dynamic process around that and being um, honest and vulnerable that that is a dynamic process. It's not going to happen through one workshop. It's not going to happen through one um, you know, art project. It's not going to happen at one uh, meeting. It's going to be a continual process of, of unlearning and learning, of undoing and redoing something that is um, much bigger than what we even have the capacity to conceive of right now. Um, I like that, so I'll do this lightning uh, piece in terms of, I love the idea of 100 year planning, which I do think that Audrey would have supported, and the idea of sniffing, but also kind of the engagement. And I think what I would add, because you know, I'm biased this way, is that we just got to organize. And that means like we organize towards a 100 year vision, have a plan to actually advance, and then be flexible enough to change that plan as we go, because the um, administration right now has been doing this amazing job of really completely dismantling the federal government. And so uh, in this next period, I feel like we've just got to be incredibly smart, strategic, and use any and all tactics, as uh, a friend of ours, Richie Perez, said many times. Yes. Maybe it's the optics of what communities believe they are and how they actually um, act, whether they're liberal or progressive or they think they're radical or they're conservative or think they are. You know, they may not, you know, act according to the script that they that's a, that's a great question. Um, the answer, I would sort of offer up that question, particularly when you have black mayors of a uh, city with black folks or black presidents of countries with black folks. That's not the type of black power we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just uh, to throw a thing for Boston. We have a black, uh, Boston has just appointed in its first um, and Boston is a city primarily of, of folks of color, and just appointed its first black uh, commissioner of police. So for everyone on the internet, and Commissioner Ross, if you're listening, it's probably worse than the old school white guy that was there before, because it's, they, they, the, the powers that be, the white power structure that be, was like, oh, if we put this guy in, you know, no one can complain anymore, right? And that was propped up, that was put there, that was made for a certain reason, right? Um, and that, and it helped us. It actually, in many ways, it's, it's just like the same thing as before with better marketing, right? And that's, a, that's harder to fight, right? People that I know that I would consider, I might have maybe considered them comrades, I saw them posing with pictures, and this guy, you know, probably voted for Trump. For, I, I would guess that he did, and that's, that ain't helping us. And I've just pointed on people here and online to a lovely little clip on YouTube of um, Fred Hampton, uh, speaking about the importance of political education in any Black Panther Party program, and he's speaking to two folks who've come into his office to um, start a community bank, I think, and uh, friends grilling them on what, you know, what's the political education piece of this project, and then he goes into why it's important, um, because we're, ta we're not talking about just changing who's in power, we're not talking about um, you know, a revolution to replace a white man with a black man or a white man with a brown woman. Uh, we're talking about a revolution of consciousness, and if people don't understand what they're fighting for and against, then they're going to they're they're going to act out of selfishness. They're going to act out of anger. They're going to act out of revenge. And it's just about uh, this marketing campaign, as you talked about. It's a lovely little clip. It's short and it's beautiful. We are sort of as a culture expecting people to, you know. Get rid of white faces in specific elected office, offices and replacing them with diversity. And while I think that he was completely out of his lane in like, talking about this, and I think, as usual, is forgetting to check his own know, There's no power when he's having these types of conversations. Um, I also would like to know, just from the three of your perspective and your experience, what are sort of the credentials that we should be expecting from these uh, candidates when we are seeing you know, black men who have maybe a history of voting for Trump, or for Kamala Harris, who has a history of supporting, um, you know, arresting parents for truancy. What should be the, in your opinion, obviously, like the basic expectations of these candidates to say, like, we're putting our support behind you? I feel like the the question is, who do we want as candidates, um, and who do we want, and also. Who do we want as candidates and who do we want as elected officials, but also recognizing that that's not the entire leadership, right? That how do we want to build leadership in our communities outside of and in addition to uh, formal political processes? So I think that's really important. But I think the second thing is that there's this, one of the things that really scare me about intersectionality and the way it's used right now is that there's a um, way in which uh, identity politics gets tokenized. 
um, and do. So I'm going to use an example. I'm going to name somebody. Uh, there's a council member named Richard Torres um, in New York City in the Bronx. Uh, who uh, was the youngest council member in his term, uh, black Puerto Rican gay man. Uh, people were really excited when he came in, mostly because of the identity of politics, not because he had a track record of accountability to communities. Um, he actually uh, led, was a lead sponsor on one of our bills in the city council in this past session. Um, the end of the story is just that he really um, did a number at the end of the session to gut the bill that he was carrying working uh, behind the scenes with the NYPD, the mayor, and the speaker at the time to really create something that went backwards. And so in the final week of um, the last city council session, uh, our organizations, including Center for Constitutional Rights, was put in the position of having to oppose a bill that we've been championing for four or five years. Um, and in his final uh, floor speech, um, he, uh, and before his final floor speech, he had gone around telling council members that the coalition um, or his opposition was homophobic, <laughs> which is really funny if you know any of us. I mean, there's part of the reason he was able to do that, though, is because there's this idea that we just have to be in alliance with somebody because of identity in terms of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, etc., but not in terms of politics. And when we think about identity politics, I want us to think about our political orientation as part of the identity. Um, and that that's actually part of what we should be holding any elected official or any uh, other leader in our community accountable to. Moving every, all the mil millions of small projects and challenges up to a higher level that frames the conversation. I think you used uh, police violence as one example. I'd love to hear some examples of how each of you have done that. Examples from a book I edited called Telling Stories to Change the World. It actually came out of, you know, when, when you were just a touch back on what you were speaking of, a 2008 moment when George Lakoff was writing about, like, oh, Democrats need this master narrative, and Democrats need a story, and they need to be better storytellers. But what he's saying is basically that Democrats just need a, you know, a slow, to create a slogan for people to get in line behind. And um, myself and uh, the two other editors, Maddie Fox and Ricky Sollinger, who really uh, came up with the project, and she's a brilliant feminist historian, you should know all her, all her work, um, said, you know, actually, if you look at the grassroots and you look at the multiplicity of stories, we can, un we can help to understand what we're fighting against. We can help to understand what's the world that we want to build, what are the claims people are making, if we just look and listen to all the different stories. And there was a story in there um, about um, a project, I think, on the West Coast called The Weed That Sets Us Free. And it was a project to engage of incarcerated women in fighting against the um, carceral system. And part of that story, the, the, um, the team who, who was um, uh, organizing the project spoke about, again, having to go in and, and engage with this narrative um, with so many of the women who understand the conditions that they live in and the conditions that led to their situation and the situation that they're in, but still have this narrative, well, I've done something bad and I deserve to be punished. Well, there's a reason for a system of punishment and punitive um, treatment and um, there must be some rationality. What are we talking about abolishing prisons for? Um, we need them. And slowly, slowly through the art making and through the conversation and through the consciousness building, uh, they were able to kind of move their thinking uh, towards uh, imagining the project is called Imagining a World Without Prisons. Um, and so that's just one project that not I'm working on, but that other people are working on um, in, in kind of that regard. The key phrase in our new mission statement is that we stand with social justice movements. And together, by fighting and building power, we sit... I think a lot of times we focus on these things because, you know, like, Fox and CNN and MSNBC telling you, you know, like they're, the election's already started. I mean, it's like, like they're really, I mean, it's started, right? And forget that, forget that. Because the most important, the single least important day in this thing we'll, we'll call American democracy is election day. The other days are, are far more important. What we do to lead up to them and what we do after them. And also, probably, the, I'll, I'll just say it to, to, to be uh, argumentative, is the least important people are also those candidates. The most important people are the people in this room, organizations like CCR, folks mm -hmm. like these women sitting on the stage with me, um, and people who are fighting like hell for freedom and are going to hold the people accountable, whether, whether it's you know, the devil gets elected or you know, the half devil gets elected. Um, and we fight like hell and believe in our own power. 
right? Because the media, the, a lot of the media tells us, it's like, this is the most important thing. If you get the good person in and they're going to do the thing that you want and they, they're the person that you believe in, then everything's going to be moderately okay. That has not worked at all. <laughs> that doesn't work, right? And it's, it's at the core, right? Like the Constitution was created this way, right? To make it so that, you know, that we don't have this power, that we actually don't have one person, one vote, right? That's not the way the system works and it's not the way the system was supposed to work. Um, but we have to take that back because what it would mean is that you have that power and that I have that power and these guys have that power. Um, and we need to fight like hell. And that, that thing is, uh, you know, from, from what other folks have told me, that's a visionary view, right? That individual people have power, have legitimate power vested in themselves and they can fight like hell for their own freedom. Um, and that's the thing I think that we should do. Thank you.